Welcome back. In this subunit, we're going to take a detailed look at the language and the application of the parole evidence rule. All right, let's refresh our memories about what the parole evidence rule is doing. Remember, parole evidence rule applies to parole evidence, which is just a prior or contemporaneous agreement. Prior or contemporaneous with what? Prior to or contemporaneous with a written agreement. If the parole evidence is being used to explain an ambiguous term in the written agreement, then we apply the plain meaning rule to determine whether the jury should hear the parole evidence. If the parole evidence is being used to contradict an express term in the written agreement, then the parole evidence rule will exclude the parole evidence. In other words, the jury will not be allowed to hear evidence, uh, excuse me, evidence of the prior agreement, the parole evidence. If the parole evidence is being used to add to the terms of the written agreement, we might let the jury hear this evidence. And the standard is, how plausible is it that the parties agreed to this prior agreement and then didn't put it into the contract. Once again, how plausible is it that the parties actually agreed to this term and then didn't include it in the written contract? If it is very plausible that the parties agreed to this and then didn't put it in the written contract, then we'll let the jury hear the parole evidence. If it is not very plausible that the parties agreed to this and then didn't put it in the written agreement, then uh, we'll, we won't let the jury hear the evidence. All right, let's refresh our memory and look at our example again. Remember, we have this written contract for the sale of Black Acre plus 50 bushels of soybean seeds, purchase price a million dollars. And we have three prior or contemporaneous oral agreements, excuse me, two prior contemporaneous oral agreements and one prior or contemporaneous written agreement. We have three different parole evidence, evidences. Three different pieces of parole evidence. Let's go with that. All right, so let's look at them one by one. First, let's look at the one that says SY321 seeds. What is that evidence doing? Well, that evidence is explaining an ambiguous term in the written agreement. What's the ambiguous term? Soybean seeds. There's lots of different types of soybean seeds. So soybean seeds is an ambiguous term. This parole evidence, SY-321 seeds, is explaining an ambiguous term in the written agreement. We apply the plain meaning rule. And under the plain meaning rule, that parole evidence will most likely be admissible to the jury. All right, let's look at our next one. The next one is whoop, over here, uh, $950,000. Purchase price, $950,000. That is our prior agreement. What does it do? It contradicts our written agreement. Our written agreement expressly says a million dollars. So we apply the parole evidence rule and the parole evidence rule excludes this evidence. The jury will not see this evidence. What is our final prior agreement? Our final prior agreement is that the seller will throw in the tractor. Is there anything about a tractor in the written agreement? No, there's nothing about a tractor in the written agreement, nothing about vehicles. So we will apply our Chris's standard. How plausible is it that the parties agreed that the seller would throw in the tractor and then didn't put it in the written agreement? Is it very plausible or very implausible? If it's very implausible, then the parole evidence rule will exclude the evidence. If it is very plausible, then the parole evidence rule will admit the evidence and let the jury see the evidence or hear the evidence of this parole agreement. All right, let's look at the actual parole evidence rule. Now, you'll see many variations of the parole evidence rule, uh, but I think this one is the best one to learn from. So if you can use this version of the parole evidence rule, 
you can use any version of the parole evidence rule, I think. All right, so what did we say about the parole evidence rule? Well, there are several things we said about it. Let's test the parole evidence rule. First, we said that the parole evidence rule will not exclude or admit a prior or contemporaneous agreement that explains ambiguous terms in the written agreement. For that, we go to the plain meaning rule. So if the prior or contemporaneous agreement explains an ambiguous term in our written agreement, then the parole evidence rule will not say anything about it. It simply says, check the plain meaning rule. And there it is. Neither of the above rules excludes any prior contemporaneous agreement that explains an ambiguous term in the written agreement, but the plain meaning rule might exclude them. All right, moving on to the rest of the parole evidence rule. What else did we say about the parole evidence rule? Well, we said the parole evidence rule will exclude any prior or contemporaneous agreements that contradict the written agreement. So if our prior or contemporaneous agreement contradicts the written agreement, the prior contemporaneous agreement is not admissible to the jury. Where does the parole evidence rule say that? Well, it says it here. The fact finder will not consider any evidence of prior or contemporaneous agreements between the parties that varies the terms of the written agreement. Here, the word varies means contradicts. It also says it here. The fact finder will not consider any evidence of prior or contemporaneous agreements between the parties that varies the written agreement. All right, now moving on. What else did we say about the parole evidence rule? Well, we said the parole evidence rule might admit a prior or contemporaneous agreement that adds to the written agreement. So we have a written agreement and we have some sort of prior or contemporaneous agreement that supplements or adds to the terms of the written agreement. This might be admissible. Where does the parole evidence rule say this? Well, first it says, if the written agreement is final and exclusive, the fact finder will not consider any evidence of prior or contemporaneous agreements between the parties that adds to the terms of the written agreement. So if our written agreement is a final and exclusive expression of our agreement, then our prior or contemporaneous agreements are not admissible, even if they just add to the terms of the written agreement. We'll talk about what final and exclusive means uh, a little bit later. All right, here it says, if the parties intended their written contract to be a final but only partial expression of their agreement, the fact finder will consider evidence of prior or contemporaneous agreements uh, that add to the written contract. So this is saying that if the written agreement is uh, only a final but partial expression of the party's agreement, then the uh, evidence of prior or contemporaneous agreements between the parties is admissible if the prior or contemporaneous agreements adds to the written agreement but does not contradict it. All right, we see how the parole evidence rule focuses on whether the written agreement was final and exclusive or final and partial. This is what we call the integration test. So if a document, if the written agreement between the parties is final and exclusive, we call that a full integration. If it's a full integration, we'll exclude the parole evidence rule that adds to the written agreement. If, on the other hand, the written agreement is final and partial, we call that a partial integration. And we will admit the parole evidence rule that adds to the written agreement. Remember our little test? 
it's basically the same test that we have. How plausible is it that the parties entered into this written agreement but agreed to something that they didn't put in the written agreement? That's all this is saying. If the written agreement is fully integrated, if it's final and exclusive, then it is highly unlikely that the parties actually agreed to that parole agreement. If, on the other hand, the written agreement is final and partial, then it is likely that the parties, or it is plausible that the parties uh, agreed to this prior agreement and didn't put it in their written agreement. In that case, we'll allow the jury to consider that parole evidence. All right, let's take another look at our example. We have our written agreement for the sale of Blackacre between the parties, uh, and we have our parole evidence. We have three bits of parole evidence. We have two prior or contemporaneous oral agreements, and we have one prior or contemporaneous written agreement. First, let's look at the oral agreement that the seeds, the soybean seeds, those 50 bushels of soybean seeds, should be SY-321 seeds. We said that this prior agreement, this parole evidence, is being used to explain an ambiguous term in the written contract. After we applied the plain meaning rule, we said this is probably admissible to the jury. All right, let's get rid of that. The jury is going to see that. Our next prior agreement that we dealt with was the prior agreement that the purchase price would be $950,000. That contradicts an express term in the written agreement. The written agreement says the purchase price is a million dollars. We apply the parole evidence rule, and under the parole evidence rule, this uh, evidence is not admissible to the jury. The parole evidence rule excludes that evidence. That leaves us with the third and final parole evidence, the prior agreement that seller will throw in the tractor. And we looked at the written agreement and we said, well, our prior agreement doesn't contradict the written agreement, but it adds to. And we asked, how plausible is it that the parties agreed to this, that the tractor is part of the deal and didn't include it in this, the written agreement? That was Chris's test, the plausibility test. What we're now going to ask, we're going to change it up a little bit. It's asking the same thing, but we're just going to change up our focus a little bit. We're going to look at this written agreement and say, is this written agreement a full integration or a partial integration with respect to this prior agreement? Once again, is this written agreement a full integration or a partial integration with respect to this prior agreement. Okay. We could focus on it. We could ask the question in a slightly different way if it'll help you. Is this written agreement a full integration or a partial integration regarding the consideration that seller will give in this transaction, which is the subject of our prior agreement? It's the same idea as the plausibility test. If you say that the written agreement is a full integration with respect to this prior agreement, what you're saying is that it's implausible that the parties really agreed to the tractor and then didn't put it in the written agreement. If, on the other hand, you say that this written agreement is a partial integration with respect to this prior agreement. What you're saying is it's plausible that the parties agreed to the tractor and then didn't put it in the written agreement, under which case you'll let the jury hear the evidence. All right, um, let's change things up a little bit and let's look at the same written agreement, but now we're going to look at two different prior agreements. One is an oral prior agreement. One is a written prior agreement. It doesn't matter for the application of the parole evidence rule. The parole evidence rule treats them the same. 
we look at them. Um, our written agreement is for the sale of Blackacre, and our uh, prior agreements are for the sale of Blackacre and Greenacre, and 50 bushels of soybean seeds plus one bushel of corn seed. So the question is, do we let the jury hear evidence of these prior agreements? Well, first, let's look at the uh, prior oral agreement, Blackacre and Greenacre. Does this, first question we're always going to ask is, does this explain an ambiguous term in the written agreement? No, there's no ambiguous term in the written agreement. Does it contradict uh, the written terms? No, it doesn't contradict the written terms. Does it add to the written terms? Yes, it adds green acre. The written terms say black acre. The prior agreement says black acre and green acre. So let's assume that black acre and green acre are both large plots of land, equally large. And the market value of this land is somewhere between $800,000 and $1.2 million for each plot of land. So now we have this background information. And under Chris's test, we ask, how plausible is it that the parties agreed that seller would sell black acre and green acre and only put in the oral, excuse me, only put in the written contract black acre? Well, it seems very implausible based on the facts that we have that each black acre and green acre are worth somewhere between $800,000 and $1.2 million. It seems that it's such a big deal that if the parties had really agreed to Black Acre and Green Acre, they would have put Black Acre and Green Acre into the contract. That's Chris's plausibility test. The way the parole evidence rule asks you to go about it is it asks you to look at the written agreement and it asks you to say, is this written agreement the final and exclusive expression of the party's agreement with respect to seller's consideration. I'll say it again. Is the written agreement the party's final and exclusive, full integration, final and exclusive uh, expression of their agreement with respect to Black Acre and Green Acre or with respect to seller's consideration? And I think the, the answer is yes. Why? It's just the plausibility test. This agreement says Black Acre, and if the parties had wanted Black Acre and Green Acre to be the deal, they would have put it in the written agreement. So with respect to Black Acre and Green Acre, this written agreement is a final and exclusive expression of the party's agreement. This written agreement is a full integration, which means that we're not going to let the jury hear the prior agreement about Black Acre plus Green Acre. All right, let's look at the next uh, prior agreement, 50 bushels of soybean seed and one bushel of that new hybrid corn seed. So we look at our written agreement, we look at our prior agreement, and we ask, does our prior agreement explain an ambiguity in the written agreement? And the answer is no. So we move on to the next question. The qu next question is, does the prior agreement contradict an express term in the written agreement? And the answer is no. Then our third question is, does the prior agreement add to the terms of the written agreement? And the answer is yes. What does it add? It adds one bushel of corn. So the question is that we'd ask under Chris's standard, how plausible is it that the parties agreed to add a bushel of corn and they didn't include it in the written agreement? I think it's fairly plausible, right? It's just such a small part of the deal. It's such a short and simple contract. That is plausible that the parties really agreed that the seller would provide an additional bushel of corn and not write it into the written agreement. Okay. How do we phrase it under the parole evidence? Well, once again, we ask, is 
this written agreement a full or partial integration with respect to adding one bushel of corn. And I think if we do the analysis, we'll say, you know what? It's probably a partial integration with respect to the one bushel of corn. So you can see how integration is a relative concept. When we looked at the written agreement with respect to the prior agreement about Black Acre and Green Acre, we said the written agreement is a full integration with respect to Green Acre and Black Acre. And because it doesn't include Green Acre, then we're not going to let the jury see that evidence about Green Acre. Uh, as we said, integration is a relative concept. So now looking at this written agreement and asking, is it fully or partially integrated with respect to our other prior agreement? 50 bushels of soybean seeds plus one bushel of corn seeds. Right? With respect to that prior agreement, our written agreement is partially integrated. And we'll let the jury hear the evidence about the one bushel of corn seed. I might want more evidence. Maybe this is a super seed and it's worth billions of dollars, but I doubt it. All right, you might be asking yourself, do the courts use a standard when determining whether a written agreement is a full integration or a partial integration? And the answer is yes. Your next question might be, do they use Chris's standard, the plausibility test? They do not, sorry. But they do use something that is very similar. It's called the natural inclusion test. And this is the natural inclusion test. The natural inclusion test says, is the prior or contemporaneous agreement one that parties would naturally and normally have included in the written agreement. If the prior agreement is one that we would expect parties to naturally and normally include in the written agreement had they really agreed to it, then the written agreement is a full integration. Think about how this works. If the parties would have naturally and normally included the prior agreement into the written agreement, and they didn't include it in the written agreement, then we're saying they probably didn't agree to it. So we're not going to let the jury see it. All right, let's kind of now apply the natural inclusion standard to our written agreement. Remember, we have a written agreement for the sale of Black Acre, and we want to know if the, the jury can hear evidence of Black Acre and Green Acre and 50 bushels plus one bushel. We did our plausibility test. You guys are good at that by now. Let's use the standard that the court will normally use. So we focus on the written agreement and we ask whether the written agreement is a full or partial integration with respect to each of the prior agreements. So first, let's focus on Black Acre and Green Acre. It doesn't contradict the written agreement. so will apply our integration test. So the question is, is the written agreement with respect to, excuse me, is the written agreement a full or partial integration with respect to the prior agreement, Black Acre or Black Acre and Green Acre? And this is how you apply it. You say, is the prior agreement Black Acre plus Green Acre an agreement we would naturally and normally expect the parties to include in the written agreement. Based on the facts that we have, we have assumed that they're both equal size plots of land, they're both worth about 800,000 to $1.2 million. So I think if the parties had really agreed to Black Acre plus Green Acre, they would have naturally and normally included it in the written agreement. It is so important that they would have naturally and normally have included it in this written agreement. Therefore, this written agreement is fully integrated with respect to Black Acre and Green Acre, that prior agreement. Thus, we will not allow the jury to see this prior agreement. Now, let's apply it to our other prior agreement. Our other prior agreement is that there's 50 bushels of soybean seeds plus one bushel of corn seed. Does that contradict our written agreement? No, it adds to. So let's ask, is our written agreement 
a full or partial integration with respect to adding one bushel of corn seed. What's our question? Would the parties naturally and normally include one bushel of corn seed into this written agreement? And I think the answer is no, because it's such a simple written agreement and one bushel of corn seed is such a small part of the deal based on my assumptions that I think the parties would not have naturally and normally included it in the written agreement. And therefore, I'm saying the written agreement is a partial integration with respect to the prior, in, uh, prior agreement about adding a bushel of corn seed. All right, let's take a look at how the two integration tests operate. Here's my standard. Remember, this is not a standard that you should use uh, when you're arguing before a court. This is just the basic idea of the integration test. So we ask, how plausible is it that the parties actually agreed to the prior contemporaneous agreement but did not include it in the written agreement? All right, then we have the natural inclusion test, which is basically saying the same thing. If the terms of the prior contemporaneous agreement are such that reasonable parties in the same situation would have naturally and normally included them in the written agreement, the written agreement is fully integrated, right? So Chris's standard is, how plausible is it that the parties actually agreed to the prior contemporary agreement but did not include it in the written agreement? If it's not plausible, then the uh, evidence of the prior written agreement is not admissible to the jury. And if we say under the natural inclusion test that they would have naturally and normally included the prior or contemporaneous agreement in the written agreement, and they did not, then it is not admissible to the jury. But we also have the natural omission test. And the natural omission test and the natural inclusion test are functionally the same test, except one is expressed in the positive, the affirmative, and one is expressed in the negative. So the natural omission test, if the terms of the prior contemporaneous agreement are such that reasonable parties in the same situation would have naturally normally omitted them from the written agreement, the, remit, the written agreement is not fully integrated. This is saying the same thing as a natural inclusion test, except your answer is gonna be slightly different. It's gonna be phrased differently. So if you say the parties would have naturally and normally admitted the prior and contemporaneous agreements from the written agreement, then the prior and contemporaneous agreements are admissible to the jury, right? You just have to say this a couple times and work your way through them on your own to fully understand how they function. All right, lastly, there is one more integration test. It's a minority test but I would be remiss if I did not mention it to you. And in our natural inclusion test or our natural omission test, that requires the judge to look at all of the evidence. It requires the judge to look at the parole evidence. It also requires the judge to look at the surrounding circumstances. That is the natural inclusion test or the natural omission test. Uh, a more conservative approach would be the four corners test. And the court, using the four corners test approach would just look at the written contract. In other words, the judge would take the written contract and say, does this contract, this written contract look fully integrated or partially integrated on its face? I don't wanna see what the parole evidence is. I don't wanna hear about the surrounding circumstances. I just wanna look at the written agreement. If the written agreement just on its face looks like a full integration to me, then I'm not gonna allow admission of parole evidence. If it doesn't look like a full integration to me, if it looks like a partial integration to me on its face, then I will admit the parole evidence. I think this is an extreme approach. I think very few courts will take this approach, but you should know of its existence. Focus on the natural omission or the natural inclusion test, whichever one you favor.